for Taboola uh, on the organic audience development team. And what that means is I spend my day with newsrooms. I work with a range of media companies to help drive new audience as well as help them set up their content management systems and set up their analytics platforms and set goals for the next year. Um, but the long and the short of it is I work with newsrooms. I spend all my day talking about traffic um, and how to actually extract uh, revenue from that traffic uh, online. And also, as Lindsay mentioned, we're here to talk about bounce rates and engagement for your websites. So I have a pretty short presentation here. It's around 20 slides. Uh, which should leave plenty of time for Q&A. So please don't be shy about your questions. That's why we're here. Uh, but for the agenda, uh, we're going to start with uh, defining bounce rate, talk a little bit about how analytics tools actually do that measurement to help uh, set a, a good stage for the rest of the conversation, talk through what does and does not count as a bounce, um, and then talk through some things we can do as far as modifying your analytics setup to more accurately track bounce rate in a way that lines up with your business goals. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move from talking about bounce rate to kind of talking about the inverse. How do we actually measure engagement? Um, and so we've got six different ways we can, or six different metrics that I want to call out um, just to get your, get the wheel spinning and, and get some ideas flowing about uh, what else you can track on your website to, to measure how engaged your visitors are. Um, and then as, also, as Lindsay mentioned, please don't be shy about the questions. We've got plenty of time for them. So to get right into it, bounce rate, at least in my experience, is the most misunderstood digital metric. Not a week goes by that I don't have at least some conversation about bounce rates with some of the folks that I work with. Uh, and most often, those conversations are driven by a misunderstanding of what that metric actually means. Um, a lot of times it'll come up because you know a designer will try and you know make mass or make fairly large uh, change changes to their website layout because they saw a small change in bounce rate without understanding what actually caused that. So I'm going to start with talking about a very simple definition for what is bounce rate. And when we're talking about bounce rate here, I'm talking about the bounce rate as reported by your analytics package. So I know most of the folks I work with use Google Analytics because it's free up to a certain point. Um, a lot of folks use Omniture. Um, and then I'll also touch on some of the other analytics packages like Chartbeat and Crazy Egg and, um, you know, there are dozens. Um, but really, we're, we're talking here about the bounce rate as you would see it in Google Analytics or any other package that you have. So to start with, what bounce rate is not has nothing to do with conversion. And that's something that I've actually hear fairly consistently where people will interchange bounce rate and a conversion rate you know, people who are signing up or purchasing from you or anything like that, it has nothing to do with conversion. Um, it also has nothing to do with time. So percentage of users who stay on your site less than a minute or 30 seconds. Um, it really has nothing to do with how long they stay on your page or your site. The percentage of users who don't take an action in your site. Again, similar to the conversion, but, you know, some folks will say, oh, they bounced because they didn't watch the video I wanted them to or anything like that. Um, or even the percentage of people leaving your site. Uh, really, all a bounce is, or bounce rate, is the percentage of visits with a single track interaction. So all it means is that the user showed up on your site, Google Analytics or whatever your analytics package is, saw one thing from them. They loaded your homepage. They read a, an article, something like that, and then we didn't see any more interaction from them. That's a bounce. So it's a percentage of sessions with a single tracked interaction. And with that, I want to take a step back a little bit and talk about how the analytics packages actually track this. And I won't go too far into the technical side of things, um, but I did want to call it out at the beginning here. So with my, uh, my example above, if a user enters your site and views a page, you have Google Analytics uh, installed on that home page a little beacon goes out and tells Google, hey, I'm seeing a user, here's the page they're on, and has a whole bunch of other information. If that user clicks another link within your site and goes to another page, that beacon gets, out, gets sent out again. And Google Analytics is smart enough to know, hey, it's the same user, they're still on the site, now they've seen two page views. So regardless of what happens after that second page view, what will be recorded at this point is one user, one session or visit, and two page views. So that would not be a bounce. 
Using the, the bottom example though, the user come in to your, comes into your site, we see the tracking beacon, it gets sent out once, and then we have no other information about what that user does, that would be recorded as a bounce. So I just wanted to call that out, and the, the key takeaway here is that every time somebody loads your page or takes an action on your site that's tracked with your analytics, a little uh, piece of uh, code goes out to Google Analytics, and that's all Google Analytics knows. It doesn't know in that if it's something is not marked up specifically with analytics code, you know, the, your analytics package has no idea what that user is doing. And here's what that beacon looks like. Again, I won't dive too far into the technical side of it, but this URL at the top gets sent out to Google Analytics or any other package, and it contains all this information about who the user is. You can see there's a client ID in there, which is basically a, a cookie that says, uh, you know, this is a particular user, so they can be tracked throughout the website. And it has everything from, you know, what viewport size they're using, uh, all the way to location and everything else included in it. But the key is that your the, the analytics code you have installed actually has to reach out to Google and say, here, log this information. And that's going to be key as we go forward, uh, because that is the only information Google Analytics has. So I want to start, and I apologize for the wall of text here, but it seemed like the easiest way to go through that. Um, but these do not count as bounces in your analytics package. So if a user visits your site, reads your page, clicks to another page, assuming your analytics is set up correctly, that will not count as a bounce. And whether that's two page views, and you know they read two pages or they read 100, um, doesn't really matter. As long as there's that second interaction, not going to count as a bounce. If a user visits your site and begins some sort of purchase funnel that takes them to another URL, that will not count as a bounce. And the key here is that it takes them to another URL that's tracked with analytics. Um, so if I add something to my cart and the cart's on a different URL, great, that'll trigger a second page view and it will not count as a bounce. And for number three, if a user visits your site and performs something that we have actually marked up with analytics code, such as watching a video that we've attached a Google Analytics uh, event to, or um, really anything that we want to mark up, then leaves. There's a second interaction, so it does not count as a bounce. If a user visits your site, reads a page, and closes your tab, and if they come back within 30 minutes, most analytics packages are going to con consider that a not, not a bounce. Uh, and that's just something I wanted to call out, that a, a typical session time, um, and this is true for Omniture and Google Analytics, is 30 minutes. So if somebody comes, researches something on your site, goes and looks elsewhere, and then comes back and say they want to come purchase whatever they were researching, um, that's all going to count as the same uh, session, as long as they're not uh, clicking on any ad campaigns or anything like that to get back to your site. So it can span over time, even if they close the tab, if they reopen that tab and continue clicking around. Uh, most analytics packages are smart enough to know that's not a bounce. So let's move into what does count as a bounce. And this is the, uh, the straightforward one that I talked through earlier. If they only read one page and hit the back button, analytics will count that as a bounce. If they... Uh, read that single page and close their browser tab and don't come back, again, that's going to be a bounce. The key is one interaction. Um, but if they come to your site and do something like click the share button or anything along those lines, if we haven't actually marked that up with analytics code, it's going to count as a bounce. So in that case, they, they're doing something that's probably good for our website that we like them doing, um, but the analytics package is still going to consider it a bounce because it's one interaction. Um, same thing with filling out a form or anything along those lines. If it's not marked up, if it doesn't take the user to another URL, it's going to count as a bounce. Uh, same thing with video. I call that out because it's a very common one that I talk about with the news groups. Um, if, we, if it's not marked up, it's going to count as a bounce. Um, and that's the key going forward, is that we can actually do quite a few things to make our bounce rate more accurate. Or maybe... Accurate is not uh, the right term, but more useful for us. Um, again, uh, I refer back to the, some of the news groups I work with. Um, our goal is to have people consume our content. So for me, if somebody spends 30 seconds reading an article 
or watching a video or anything like that, I don't consider that a bounce, or I may not want to in my analytics package. And so the first thing we can do, it's actually pretty common, is to set an event that fires if somebody stays a certain amount of time on your page. In this case, uh, I use 30 seconds. Um, and I wanted to put the code in here just uh, as an example, um, although every event's going to be slightly different. Uh, but this is for the, the two most common versions of Google Analytics. And essentially, when uh, what happens is you set a timeout that says, hey, if somebody's still here in 30 seconds, fire this code. Um, and in this, this case, what I have is an event um, titled 30 underscore seconds. Um, and so that's something that we can optimize against because now we're actually tracking that event so I can tell exactly how many people spend over 30 seconds on my pages. But it also allows my bounce rate to be a little more accurate. Uh, another example that's very common is to fire an event whenever the social media buttons are clicked or anything else that we consider a good thing on our page or one of our goals. Um, tracking video plays, clicking through a slideshow, anything along those lines can be marked up in such a way that it's going to reduce our bounce rate. And now when you make these changes, your bounce rate will drop quite a bit, likely. Um, but then you have a new baseline, and it's something you can optimize against. Uh, one other call out here is that if you're using infinite scroll or any other form of continuous consumption, um, you know, auto-loading new content, anything like that, um, it can be a little tricky at times, but we want to make sure that that's marked up properly so that if I'm scrolling down a list of articles or a list of videos or anything like that, um, that we're triggering a page view when I come to that second, third, fourth page. Um, that'll make my bounce rate more accurate. And again, as I'm making decisions for my website, um, I'll have some real numbers that I can benchmark against uh, doing my A-B testing. Another thing that's important to call out, bounce rate, maybe more than any other metric um, for your website, is going to change quite a bit based on what segments you're looking at. So this top example, I happen to know their bounce rate is uh, around 70%. It's a news website. They get a lot of their or traffic from Facebook. And users are coming basically just to read whatever link they happen to see in their Facebook feed. Sometimes they'll click around. Most of the time, they just hit the back button. So this top one is actually comparing the bounce rate for their home page to a specific article that did very well earlier this week. And we can see the, the difference is 30% for the home page and an 87% bounce rate for people who landed on the article. So that's an important one to keep in mind as you're looking, when you open up Google Analytics, you're going to see one bounce rate. But in order to make decisions about your website, you really need to kind of dive in and figure out what traffic sources are doing, what different pages are bouncing at. Um, and you can see that in the middle one. Again, same website. We've got 88 for that, that particular article I was talking about. Facebook had an 88% bounce rate, but Google only had a 78% bounce rate. Um, and I don't have any examples here, but one thing to call out is this is especially true for paid campaigns. You'll likely find that if you have two different pieces of creative, even if they go to the same article, that they're going to have a very different bounce rate. And that's because you're setting up different expectations for your users. So if you're looking at creating campaigns through Taboola or through Google, Analy or Google AdWords or anything like that, um, it's very important that you dive down into the specific campaign level or even the creative level to look at your bounce rates uh, because it will vary quite a bit. Um, another thing that's, that's become much more popular over the last three or four years is to look at your demographics. So you may want to segment out users that are in the US versus users abroad. Um, you may want to look at men versus women if you're selling a particular type of product and you know it's going to appeal to one sex more than the other. Um, you can look at different age groups. If you're focusing an ad campaign on a different, a specific demographic, if you're looking for men, you know, 50 plus, call that out as a segment. Look at the bounce rate for that target specifically so that the other information on your website or the other users to your website um, aren't changing what you're looking at, um, or at least aren't obfuscating the actual results. Um, and then the last call out is it's combinations of all of these things. Um, again, I spend my day in analytics, so it's, it's kind of natural to me to, to dive in. Uh, but 
you'll find that, uh, and we'll get to this a little bit later when we're talking about uh, how to set your KPIs, but you really want to focus on what matters to your business and figuring out what that is, what the bounce rate is for that audience segment um, is really where you're going to want to focus any changes to your website or anything else going on. And this is a biggie that I actually get lots and lots of questions about. I think we all understand at this point what a bounce is. And, you know, the bounce is a single interaction. And there is a lot of misinformation out there about how that can affect Google traffic and Facebook traffic. So I just want to be very specific about what we do know. Um, last year, about a year ago, Facebook did announce that the time spent on your page does affect your organic reach in Facebook. Um, and it actually does affect your, your ad uh, ranking as well. And what that means is if Facebook's trying to decide between site A and site B and which article to show to a particular user, um, one of the things they're going to fall back to is which site does that user tend to spend more time on? If there's one site where they click, look at one picture and hit the back button really quickly, uh, that may show that it's not necessarily an engaged user. So maybe they'll show the other website where the, the user clicks through and spends 30, 40 seconds before they come back. Uh, we don't know how big of a, a factor it is, uh, but from all the data and experience that I've seen, it's actually a pretty, uh, a pretty large one. Um, and, you know, the other thing that this does is it can show, uh, you know, kind of large issues with site design or, you know, Facebook traffic is mostly mobile. So... Uh, maybe your mobile layout isn't as uh, enticing as your desktop. Um, definitely something to look at uh, and optimize against. And then the biggie that everybody always talks about, does my bounce rate affect my Google traffic? Google has never confirmed that they do. Uh, one thing I want to call out is that Google will never use your Google Analytics information. Um, they're very specific about that. They don't have access to it. But what they do have access to is tracking user behavior when they're on a search, uh, search result. And this is really how both Facebook and Google measure bounce rate as it, as it affects your, your traffic. Um, and this is something called pogo sticking. And I, I, I borrowed this slide from, uh, from Moz.com. But what, they're, what Google and Facebook are both looking at is, uh, for instance, with Google, if I go search for pogo sticks and I click the first link, spend three seconds, click the back button to go back to the search result, and then continue down the page. Because the first one didn't have what I wanted, so now I click on the second one. It doesn't have what I wanted, I click back. But say I go to the third one, and Google doesn't see me anymore. That's a pretty good indication to Google that that third link is going to answer the question. If somebody's searching for pogo sticks, maybe that third link should be first instead of the first one because that tends to capture users' engagement um, versus the first one where a lot of users are clicking the back button. So I'm sure we're going to have a couple questions about this one. It's a big one. Um, but it goes to the core. The reason I think it's part of the ranking factor is it goes to the core of what Google's trying to do. Google's trying to satisfy users, and they're trying to give users the information that Google thinks a user is searching for, um, and engagement is just one of the many things they can track um, that's going to help that. You know, they're going to call your page and everything else. But anytime you can get users to stick around on your page and click around and actually satisfy what they're looking for is going to help your search traffic. Um, so as I wrap up this slide, I just want to call out that all Google has access to is this idea of pogo sticking. They know that you came back three times and clicked on three different links before you were satisfied. They don't have any access to any of the other events that we were talking about. Um, you know, setting up, um, tracking on your videos or anything like that. All they know is whether the user stuck around on your page and how long they did. Uh, this probably has uh, some effect on some other, all of your other traffic sources as well. Uh, but for this, we'll focus on the organic side of uh, Facebook and Google. And as we kind of wrap up the bounce rate portion, a um, couple things that I want to chat through. One is that a bounce is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, 
bounce rate that we've been talking about is just a very specific metric in your analytics, and it's just one of many. And we'll talk through some more here in a minute. But you know, it may not be a bad thing if you're an informational site, and you know somebody's coming to research a particular topic. They come to your website, you give them the correct answer, you collect some ad revenue, and they disappear. It may not it may not be a bad thing. Now, if you're trying to sell red widgets and they come to your page and just bounce right back and disappear, yeah, maybe the bounce rate's a little more important to you. But you always have to keep in mind the context of why a user is coming to your websites. Um, another call is that the bounce rates can be manipulated. So anything that we do on our website to add events or change our analytics code or try and get fancy and custom is going to affect our bounce rate. So one thing to call out, especially if it's a new website or you don't work very closely with your tech team, if your bounce rate changes, we want to make sure that we're um, talking to them and figuring out exactly where uh, the analytics code is implemented, how it's implemented, making sure that the actual tracking beacon is firing, um, and that we're not doing something like triggering four page views on the home page. You know, we have to be very careful if we're going to use bounce rate as a, a metric for a business that we're tracking it correctly. And at the end of the day, these engagements metrics that we're about to talk through, we want to choose the ones that actually matter for your business. Again, going back to my examples from the first uh, bullet here, if you know, I'm focused on ad revenue, I'm going to pick different KPIs than I am uh, if I'm focused on selling widgets. Right? If I'm selling widgets, what really matters to me is how many people start the purchase flow, for instance. Um, and so when we look at engagement there, reading two articles, probably doesn't matter all that much to me. It's a good thing, but what I'm really looking for is tracking uh, people who begin the purchase flow. So in this case, we don't want to always focus on bounce rate. It's just one of many tools in our, uh, in our belt that we can use to figure out whether our audience is engaged. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to flip back here real quick before we move on from bounce rate and call out one thing that I forgot to. Um, there are a number of tools that all the analytics, I think every single analytics tool uh, provides some version of this. Um, but there are browser plugins that allow you to see what analytics beacons are sent and what analytics packages are installed on a website. Um, so this is something that everybody can do. It takes a little bit of playing around with to, um, to get used to them. Um, but you don't always have to de depend on your tech team to um, confirm whether or not your analytics is firing. Um, this particular tool is called GA Debugger, um, and what it does is every time it sees analytics code, it grabs all of these little bits of information um, and splits it out into something that's useful or something that's readable. Um, Google Analytics or Google also has what's called Google Tag Manager, um, which I think is on Firefox as well as Chrome. Um, I tend to use the Chrome version, um, but that will show you any analytics package or any an Google Analytics tags on the page and what information is being sent. Um, I know, you know, Omniture, everybody has their own version of this. So just, um, you know, go to the support version of whoever your analytics package is, um, and it should be pretty easy to download and install. Um, but that way you can see everything on your website. If you're curious about how a competitor is optimizing, sometimes it's really interesting to go look at what your competition is doing. Um, you know, if they're sending people to a landing page with a video on it, and you know they're marking it up as to exactly how long the user is watching that video. Yeah, could be interesting for you to do as well. Um, but at the very least, you can see what kind of information they're tracking, um, which could give you some good ideas. So flipping through, I talked about bounce rate. Right, bounce rate is the absence of engagement. It's just a very straightforward metric. It's very binary. Either there was one interaction or there were more. Um, but the kind of inverse of that is engagement. And that's people doing more than one thing on your website, or really people doing anything on your website once they come. Um, and so there are a number of different uh, metrics we can use here. I happen to pick six out here just to try and um, kind of get some conversations and questions flowing. Um, but these are six that I use fairly often. Um, metrics we can use and report on that help measure how engaged your audience is. Um, and each of these will have their own slide, but 
Um, the, the six that I chose are time on site, pages per session, sessions per user, anything around a conversion funnel, anything around video or gallery consumption, because that means uh, so much to so much, many of our uh, bottom lines. Um, and then we'll talk again, we'll kind of recap a couple of the other custom events that we can do. Time on site is a really interesting one. And again, I, I think it's fairly misunderstood. Um, so I'll start off with looking at Google Analytics tracks it by default. Um, and you can segment out any, any piece of traffic and see what your Facebook traffic, your organic Facebook traffic versus your paid Facebook traffic, or your Taboola traffic versus any other ad campaigns you're running. Um, time on site is an interesting one. It doesn't necessarily mean they're buying, uh, but it does mean that at least they clicked your page and didn't hit the back button right away. Um, so time on site is an interesting one. Um, I want to call out here that uh, Chartbeat and give them a, a shout out because I use them often. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, um, this is just a, a random article I picked, um, but this is how they show their engaged time. They're showing six users spending an average of 40 seconds on this particular article. And 40 seconds is pretty good because it's all Facebook traffic. So somebody would just happen to be scrolling through their feed, saw something interesting, and spending 40 seconds I think is, uh, is pretty reasonable for an average news article. Um, but they call it out in a slightly different way, um, as do like Crazy Egg, and there's a whole bunch of different analytics platforms that uh, kind of focus on engagement. But over on the right side, um, is, is something I, I definitely want to make sure that we cover. And this is how tools like Google Analytics and Omniture track your time on page or time on site. So if they spend 10 seconds on your first page, 15 seconds on your second page, click to a third page, and then close their browser tab. This is an interesting one because Google has no idea when they left. There's no sort of event that fires off to Google that tells them that somebody's moved on from your website. All it knows is that they spent 10 seconds here, 15 seconds there, and then did load the third page, but that's all Google knows. And in this case, what, what Google would track is this, Google would track this, uh, and Omniture would both track it as a 25 second time on site, because that last part is unknown. Now, if we have marked up our, our sites like we talked about earlier and marked up things like a video watch or a conversion funnel start or a newsletter sign up, um, that's going to be an event. And that may be you know, an extra 10 seconds after they load page three that that fires. And Google's going to see that and would, would tack that extra 10 seconds onto your time on site. So basically, it's Google measures it from the time of your first interaction to the time of your last interaction. Um, and I just want to keep reiterating that Google has no idea what the user did after that because it's not marked up. But time on site is a really interesting one. Um, it's not going to apply to all of your, uh, your websites, particularly those uh, you know, looking at uh, you know, selling specific products. But if you're trying to get people to sign up and you're looking at how long people spend on a video or you know, articles or anything like that, it's a good one to keep in mind. Um, and it is one that, for most of the folks I work with, I uh, report on regularly. So same as I would track the number of uniques every month and um, you know any other metrics that we all care about that affect our bottom line, um, I also report on the time on site um, because it shows how good we are of not only getting those users but keeping them engaged. The second one is pretty straightforward. Pages per session. So if, if you're a, a content company that's actually just creating, uh, call it news articles or informational articles, trying to get people engaged, pages per session is a really good thing to track. And the other reason I like it is because it's actionable. More than any other of these metrics, I think, um, this is driven by page design and what kind of widgets we have on the page. So if, if, whether you're using a Taboola recirculation widget or the default WordPress top posts for your blog or anything like that, what, con what supplemental content we're presenting to users and how we're presenting it uh, aesthetically is really going to affect this one. Um, so in this particular case, uh, we can see um, somewhere at the end of March, they launched a redesign. And our pages per visit drop like a rock. Um, and this one happened to, to start dropping because 
um, the page layout was breaking and you couldn't see the related articles that, that we were pushing. Um, so over the next couple weeks, we actually expanded the number of related links we have on the page and used uh, some organic recirculation there um, and tweaked the page design and we see it shot right back up to where it was before launch. Well, then we started adding some different uh, overlay ads and some different things into the page and we can see that it's been dropping consistently since then. Um, overall, the site design worked. So we actually re we report on this, but we haven't made a whole ton of changes to the site due to it. Um, it is something to keep in mind, though, um, that the choices we make really do affect how many page views people are, are actually viewing. Metric number three, sessions per user. Um, this is an interesting one, um, especially if your business depends on brand loyalty. Uh, you know, there are some websites that, that we work with that uh, really just depend on bring somebody in and then get them to either sign up for lead generation or make a purchase right then. Uh, but the vast majority of them actually depend on having users come back to their site and know their brand um, before they make a purchase. And so this is a, a report, just a default report in Google Analytics that shows how many people come back how often. Um, and I forget what the, I think this was a month that I picked for this particular website. Um, but as we look at it, the majority of people came in once. So they're drive-bys. They get a lot of Google traffic. A lot of Google traffic will come back once. Your brand may not stick, and they may not come back. But um, we have a lot of folks at two sessions. And then we can actually see that we've got a ton of people with nine-plus uh, uh, sessions over the course of this month. Um, and this lines up because we have a lot of newsletters um, and a lot of social activity that really tries to draw people back to our website. Um, and this is, again, as we're looking at how we want to design our website, if we want to um, put some calls to action to sign up, to like our page on Facebook, anything along those lines, um, this is the metric to look at to figure out if those things are actually getting the audience to come back. Um, again, we want to match up our, our success metric with, with what our goal of the changes are. Um, there's a ton of ways to slice and dice this. Um, but the easiest way i found is just to pick a particular uh, time frame um, and see how many people are actually coming back versus your, your one session users. Engagement number four, conversion. I honestly didn't know how to present this slide, so I wanted to just call out a few things here. Your, your conversion is going to completely depend on your business, right? So using my examples before, maybe my conversion is staying on an article more than 30 seconds because I know that's going to get me the ad revenue I need. Um, if my conversion is actually to purchase something or download an app or anything along those lines, um, that's going to be a key, key metric that I want to track. And it's probably more important to me than somebody reading 15 articles. Um, at the end of the day, if I'm trying to get people to download an app or, or, or purchase something, that needs to be tracked. So I want to call out that you know the other thing that you know tracking conversion does in all of these analytics packages is it gives you a whole bunch of fancy reports. Um, on the left is something called Goal Flow, um, and this is for a website that's uh, pushing people to the App Store to download their app. But you can track in the upper left-hand corner. You can track by landing page, track by traffic source, anything else to quickly compare. Um, any of those metrics and how they actually get to your conversion point. Um, so again, it's going to depend totally on your your business and and what your your goal is for that user. Um, but it's always worth tracking. Um, upper right hand corner, wanted to call out. You can actually assign dollar values, um, and that's something that a lot of people are surprised that you can do. Um, but it's really easy in the code. Um, and in this particular case, they've assigned dollar values to each. Uh, sign up because they know that if somebody signs up for the newsletter, um, their conversion rate is X percent and they're likely to spend $300. Uh, so that lead may be worth $5 to them or something like that. Um, and so you can set different goals here and uh, assign dollar values to them um, and just see a really quick chart of how much money are we making. Um, really easy to compare traffic sources, ad campaigns, and everything else. Um, but as you're choosing which metrics to track, keep in mind uh, which secondary metric to track, I guess, for lack of a better term, 
not only are they signing up, but how much is that worth to me? This sign up may be worth $2, that sign up may be worth $5, um, and then I can blend those together and get a goal value. Um, the other thing these packages do is it'll show you exactly where people are converting. So I may have a newsletter sign up button across my entire website. Uh, you know, the analytics package is going to show you where people are signing up. Um, and I grade this one out, but in this particular case, the vast majority of their goals are on a particular page, but then it spreads out amongst the, uh, the rest of the pages. So I could look at the second URL and say, hey, that's not bad. You know, it's, it's genera it generated $1,700 for me uh, last month. Is there something I can do to optimize that um, to get a few more goals coming through? Conversion is pretty straightforward. I've mentioned videos and galleries quite a few times, so I won't harp on them here. Um, I just wanted to call out a few different ways, and these are all live examples that I, I pulled earlier this week, of different ways that we've marked up video and gallery consumption. In the uh, upper left-hand corner, um, actually happens to be a, a third-party video player that we integrated with. Uh, and we had very, very few options as to where we could actually put the analytics code. So basically what we did is we can tell when something is started. We can tell when something is auto-played. So when somebody hits, somebody hits the play button, we log that as a start, a video start. Um, at some point, we're going to have a video ad. Um, and in this case, you can see the video ad is at the very, very beginning of the, uh, of the video. So we've got an ad start. We've got a ad complete just to see how many people make it through the ads, et cetera, et cetera. We can choose these metrics. Some of it's going to depend on the technical side of what your player allows you to do or not. Um, but we can usually choose just about any metric we want. Same thing on the right side, just a slightly different way of looking at it with the options available to us. Here's how we looked at it, or here's how we, uh, we tracked it. Um, the playing is actually uh, the live stream for them, um, but the watched means it completed. Um, and on down the line. On the left side is a particular gallery uh, that I work with. And what we chose to do is, well, I think I must have had a filter here, but we do track page one as well. Um, for an article that has a slide gallery in it, we track exactly how many people click through to the next gallery. Um, and that can be really useful here. And you know the numbers, I guess, aren't terribly surprising that the vast majority, or a lot of people are going to click through the, the second slide, but less so on page three, page four, page five, et cetera. And so all the galleries on the side are marked up like this. Um, and then using Google Analytics, we can filter down to a specific gallery to see how it's doing. We see a sharp drop off. Maybe we need to change the order of the slides or, or change what's in here. Um, and then some people will just do like a, a previous and next. That's an easy way of going about it. We wanted to see how many people are hitting the back button. Any of these types of things that um, we're making business decisions based off of, how many galleries we want, things like that, mark it up with the analytics code. That way you can report on exactly how engaged people are. Last metric here for metric number six, other custom events. You name it, you can track it. What's important to your business? Um, and the left-hand example is uh, a setup that tracks social shares. They get a lot of comments, so you know we track how many comments we're getting, how many Facebook shares uh, from the website, Twitter, email, etc. Um, and this is really interesting because it gives us a different view. Facebook tells me how many times my URL was shared across the entire web, but in this case, all I'm worried about is what's going on on my website, what happens to this number if I make my Facebook share button bigger, um, or if I put one at the top and bottom of an article. Um, these are actual website interactions, so it helps us make decisions. Um, upper right-hand corner, we can track events of uh, people switching sections. In this particular case, it's a, it's a Canadian group, and they've got uh, different home pages for different uh, locations. And so they can, it's really interesting to them, and they want to know how many people um, come in to the Edmonton uh, page and actually switch to Toronto. Because that means maybe we're not giving them what they want in the very beginning, um, and you know we want to make sure that we're uh, detecting where they're at and everything else. So changing sections. Um, if you have a read more or load more button, put a, put a tag on it. That's an engagement. That, that's a sign that users are actually um, engaging with the content and doing what we want to. 
just about anything can be marked up on your website. And as we wrap up here, I just want to kind of wrap this all up into a quick discussion about how to choose your metrics. At the end of the day, you want to choose metrics, engagement metrics, that actually lead to your desired action. Is your desired action a purchase or a newsletter sign up or lead generation? Work your way back from that and get down to a granular metric that we can track in Google Analytics. Uh, the world I live in is driven by ad revenue. And so this is a conversation I have frequently with groups when I start working with them, um, is that you know, a lot of people will think more users equals more ad revenue, or more page views and more ad revenue. And that's all the report on, right, is number of page views, RPM. But in reality, your ad revenue is going to be driven by frequency times depth times audience times your RPM. So it's made up of not just a page view, but it's visits per user, how deep do they go, how many pages do they visit, how many users came through the door, and then how much do I get per page view. And so breaking it down like this can be really interesting and actually ch I've seen it change how organizations work because when I break my RPM times page view equation down into very specific trackable metrics, there are things I can do that will affect each of these four uh, metrics here on the bottom. Visits per user, I can push things like a newsletter sign up or change when I send my newsletters out. I can push people to sign up for or like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Pages per visit, like I said, that one's driven mostly by uh, site design. Do I want to change my article template? Number of users, uh, you know, anything I can do there, right? I can uh, start pushing some ads. I can work on my SEO um, to bring more people through the door. And then obviously RPM, um, there's a lot we can do there. Um, but I found that it's very useful to go through this for each of your businesses and start with the obvious one, right? RPM times page views, but then break it down into things that we can both track and affect. Um, and that's different for everybody, so this, just, this particular example is, is what we work with for ad revenue. Um, but it is very important and can lead to a lot more success. And with that, we're wrapped up. It looks like we're about uh, at least 8.45 on the uh, West Coast, so we've got plenty of time for questions. Lindsay, uh, do we have any questions at this point? Um, so, yeah, I think we have a few coming in here. Um, our first question is, what is a good or acceptable bounce rate for my site? Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, and I wrestled with uh, how to put it into the, the actual slides, and I, I, I neglected to. Uh, there is no good bounce rate. It's going to depend um, quite a bit on what your website is. Here, let me flip back to here. It's going to depend on what kind of website you're, you're, you're working with, uh, what your traffic sources are. Uh, you know, using this, this, uh, this top example, your bounce rate is going to vary. You'll, you'll, if you were to research this on Google, you'll see people that say anything above 20% is terrible. Then you'll see people who say anything above 80% is terrible. Um, but that's because they're working with different websites. Uh, if I'm working with a paid campaign that has a very specific conversion goal, um, you know, maybe I'm looking at trying to get my bounce rate down in the 10, 20% range. Um, but if I'm a news website that's just trying to increase my traffic from Google, then I'm less worried about the bounce rate um, because I know that the Google traffic is just answering a very specific question and that it's going to bounce more. So the answer is there's really no example or there's really no answer to that question. Um, we really just want to focus on what your site, tracking what your site's doing right now and try and make it better. Um, but I would actually ignore most of the stuff you see out there about bounce rates and what's good and what's bad, um, especially as it's tied to Facebook and SEO, because um, there's just the whole range of information. It's totally going to depend on what traffic segment you're looking at and uh, what type of site you have. Okay, great. Uh, let's see another question here. Um, how often should I look at bounce rates, daily or monthly, would you recommend? Well, I would answer that for any of these engagement metrics. And, you know, focusing on that last slide I was on, um, I like to report on metrics weekly with the clients I work with. Um, 
it's going to depend on, on how active you are. For paid campaigns, I may look at it every day. Um, I would definitely look at the bounce rate anytime we're making changes to either the traffic acquisition side, you know, adding a new campaign, new creative, new things like that, or anything we're doing to the page. Um, bounce rate is a, is a really useful um, kind of signal that either we're doing what we want or we're not um, in those cases. So I try and uh, report on all of these metrics at the same time. So if we're looking at ad revenue, instead of just saying, hey, we got a million uh, uniques and, and five million page views, actually break it out. Put some engagement metrics in there when you send around your reports. Um, and that way your executives or your employees, uh, conversely, um, have a better sense of what people are doing on your website. Um, I would report on them all at the same time. Data is always good. It's going to trigger an idea for somebody of something they can do to uh, increase one of these metrics or decrease bounce rate. Okay, great. Um, we're getting a few uh, specific questions here that are very tabula related and a little bit more involved. So those might be better if I share those with Chris um, offline and he can answer those over email after the session. Um, some of these might also be best answered by AMs as well if we want to get some of their input. Um, so I can- hey, Lindsay, sorry to interrupt, but uh, for everybody that's asking the very specific questions about bounce rates with taboo ads and stuff like that, feel free to uh, loop me in uh, with your account manager or just ask your account manager to, to loop me into the thread um, and we can uh, address that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, probably easier, but yeah, that'd be helpful. Definitely. Yeah, we'll definitely, get, I'll get those over to Chris afterwards and uh, we'll have everyone connect over email on that. Um, so I think if those are all the questions we have, um, I just want to let everyone know that you will be receiving the deck as well as the recording in our follow-up messaging. And as I said, I'll share these extra questions coming in about specific Taboola ads with Chris. Um, so thank you for everyone for tuning in today, and thank you, Chris, for presenting. Thanks, everybody. Bye.